The grace and love of our Lord and Savior be with us always. Amen. The word of God we want to consider today is the beginning of our Old Testament reading for this past Sunday, the fifth Sunday after Pentecost. We're looking at Job chapter 38, especially verses 1 to 4 right now. Then the Lord answered Job out of the storm. He said, Who is this that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. My dear friends in Christ, there was a man who attended a church service, an evening church service, at a certain church, and the pastor at that service was preaching a message dealing with the subject of the triune God. He talked about, as scripture says, that we have one God, but that that one God is made up of three persons, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Anyway, he preached about that, and after the service was over that night, this man came up to the pastor and was saying that he had a hard time grasping what the pastor was saying. He said, I enjoyed your service, but I'm not convinced of what you said. I just cannot get it through my head that there are three persons and yet only one God. Well, the pastor then asked the man, um, now what is your hat size? And the man responded, six and seven eighths, but why do you ask? To that the pastor said, I was just wondering how you expected to get this great and almighty and majestic God of heaven into six and seven eighths. The pastor's point was really very simple. How can we sinful human beings, and even without that sinful part, how can we human beings fully grasp or understand our God, much less the fact that he's the triune God that he is? How can we comprehend our great God? How can we always or even sometimes really understand our God? Now, that's the problem that Job was faced with in the events around his life at this particular time. He couldn't understand why God was allowing the hardships and the troubles that he was facing in life. He couldn't understand what was going on in his life, and so he complained to God. He challenged God. He felt as if God was being unfair with him. In, in our lives, under different circumstances, we may, we may feel the same way. We may feel like challenging, questioning God. And see, that's what our reading for today really is addressing, those times when we ask, why God? The book of Job, it treats the problem of suffering in this world, particularly the question of why it is that, that people who believe in God are people who also end up suffering in the course of this life. This story of Job, it's one of the more familiar stories in the Old Testament, really, at least the beginning and end of the story. The book is 42 chapters long, and when I say the beginning and end is what people know, well, oftentimes people know the first two chapters and the last chapter, and the middle part of the book is something that a lot of people don't know about. They don't know how much Job struggled with the different trials and troubles that he was facing in this life. They don't understand 
how he struggled until the time when, when God restored his health, his wealth, and his family. In our story, the way it starts out, we're not going to look at the opening chapters, but really the basic story was Job was a very wealthy man. He was very blessed by God. He was very blessed by God. He seemed to have everything going for him. But then one day the Lord allowed Satan into his presence and God boasted to Satan about what a great believer Job was. And when God said that, Satan responded by saying, ah, the only reason why Job is such a great believer, why he is the admirable man that he really is, is because you blessed him so much. And what Satan said to God is, if you took away all of the blessings that you gave to him, what he'd end up doing is he'd just end up cursing God and dying. So God gave Satan permission to take away from Job all of the blessings that he had. He took away his riches, his children, his seven sons and his three daughters, and even his health. When Satan got through with Job, Job basically had nothing, at least from the earthly point of view. He had sores all over his body. He was repulsive to look at, and he had endured more pain and suffering than any believer, apart from the Lord Jesus, any believer, any human being experiences in the course of this life. And, and under these circumstances, Job's wife, he still had her, but she wasn't much of a blessing. Instead of encouraging and comforting him, what she did is she encouraged him to curse God and die. She said at this low point in his life, are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. To that, Job replied, you are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? And then there were a few of Job's friends who came in and they were supposedly going to help Job. And what instead they did is they looked at Job and his suffering and they were absolutely convinced that there was some specific sin that he had committed that meant that God was treating him in the way he was. And we know from the story that there wasn't some specific sin that Job was dealing with. Through, throughout this ordeal, Job was struggling and he was weak in his faith, but he did remain faithful to God. And what pulled him through in those tough times and what can pull us through in our tough times in life is our God-given, God-worked faith. And Job's God-given, God-worked faith, it motivated him to confess, I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes, I and not another, how my heart yearns within me. When we ask, why God? We're often inclined to ask why God, especially when we're faced with life's trials, troubles, and temptations. But maybe that's not when we should ask God, why God? Because we're sinners. And because we're sinners, kind of like the trials and troubles and temptations are kind of what we have coming to us. Maybe that's not when we should be asking why God. Maybe more what we should be doing is asking why God when we're faced with God's blessings, when things are going good in this life. Because is that what we deserve? But you know what the truth is, is that why God? 
Well, the reason why we enjoy good times is because God is gracious and merciful. And the reason why we experience the trials and the troubles and the temptations, that's also because God is a good and gracious God. God is working through, well, the supposed bad times. He's working through the good times, the blessings, through all of that because his ultimate goal is always to get us to our eternal home to heaven. He's always working for our good. So that means that, yes, there are going to be those times when we ask, why God? Because we're struggling like, like Job. But instead of asking why God, maybe we'll want to keep on saying, Thank you, God, for sending all things, for allowing all things into my life when you're working to bless me, to get me home to heaven. Now see, that was God's plan with Job. That's God's plan with us also. That's God's plan for you. Thank you, God. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, when I'm inclined, when we're inclined to ask, why God? Help us always to remember you are our gracious, loving God who wants us forever in heaven with you. And you're always working through everything in our lives to get us there. Thank you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you always.